Hello, I'm Robert Dakota of Worldviews Media, and I'm here to introduce you to a really interesting character, Ty Goff. They're coming from uh, Hawaii and Maui. When I say they, I mean him and his wife, Rebecca, uh, because I see them as a team and doing lots of things together. I'm introducing you to Ty because we're going to be bringing him here for the autumn equinox. Um, he's going to be bringing some very interesting material to the table that will support the earth origins that we've been doing, the podcast that we're going to continue doing. And he's grounded in sacred geometry. He's a high-end carpenter. Um, if you know uh, other high-end carpenters like Jesus, uh, <laughs> they're down to earth and grounded. And, you know, um, mm -hmm. I've known a lot of carpenters. I was a carpenter myself before in Bavaria. And I, I think carpentry um, brings you into a lot of math, brings you into design, brings you into pattern, um, and helps you identify things that are related to construction and building. Ty has been doing that for more than 30 years, along with uh, joining his wife and taking tours, free diving with whales and dolphins um, for consciousness adventures and healing. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Ty. Before I turn it over to Ty, I just again want to remind you we're going to have him here for a very special weekend, September. It's over the autumn equinox. It'll be the weekend right after, be the 22nd to the 24th. Without further ado, Ty, could you join in here and, um, you know, show us what you were sharing on your share screen? And you got it bring in you know the sacred geometry that's related to Egypt that you've been studying for many years and how it reveals there's a relationship um, to other pyramids and other cultures around the world I believe is something you're trying to reveal is that not correct yes there is a pattern that the Egyptians used throughout their entire cultural history something that has continued up till today um, there are other cultures that are still using it now. And as far as how far it goes back behind Egypt uh, into the ultra ancient past, that's something that is speculative at this point. Nobody really knows exactly how far things go back. But uh, what's important is that there's been a disconnect, and this disconnect has been going on for some time between alternative theorists and the uh, conservative theorists around who knew what, when, where, and how, and why they did what they did, if they even did it, uh, because there's a lot of contention as to whether or not the Giza Plateau is something the Egyptians themselves did. And part of that comes from this idea that the Egyptians didn't know geometry. Um, and this has been essentially uh, promulgated through the uh, conservative Egyptologists and archaeologists, they didn't recognize there being a mathematical pattern behind these um, uh, monumental constructions, not in any way that would lead them to believe that there was some secret knowledge. Uh, and of course, they don't believe in any of the unity, the geometric unity models like squaring the circle, because they've been asking repeatedly, where is this contextual evidence that shows the Egyptians use this somewhere other than in the Great Pyramid. Um, and that's what my work does. It actually eliminates this forever. There will never be a question whether or not the Egyptians knew or did not know geometry. They absolutely knew it. And the thing is, is Egyptologists that have seen my work already uh, back in November of last year, uh, every single one of them completely changed their belief system around what the Egyptians knew. They were complete shock. They were actually quite excited because it's something completely new and different. It's an entirely new way of looking at Egypt, something that hasn't happened before. Um, and gentlemen that are part of uh, American University at Cairo Press, uh, I was able to show them my work as well. And they said, once I put the book or this kind of work out, they will be pushing it around in Egypt because again, as I said, it's, it's fresh, brand new perspective. And it actually fulfills a lot of, um, a lot of kind of 
undone, left undone scenarios in regards to like the flower of life. What was that as far as did it actually really fulfill its promise um, as being everything coming out of it? Well, it turns out there's actually a model that it sits on top of, that it's its own progenitor. In other words, there's a secret behind it that hasn't been revealed yet um, in how it actually creates Egypt. And had the founder of the Flower of Life teaching recognized this particular pathway, all of Egypt would have unfolded before him. But unfortunately, he did not realize that. And so that knowledge has been hiding in plain sight for the last you know, 35 years. So that's pr pretty much what the work is about. As far as the name of this workshop, uh, the quantum gate of Ma'at, circling the divine. Ma'at is, um, well, she it's played as a feminine uh, character. It's They call her Netter. Netter means nature. So it's the nature of. So the nature of order, the nature of uh, harmony. And these, these ideas, the nature of justice, all the things that are required to raise human consciousness to a higher plateau than just animal man up to human and beyond. And it's something that is necessary for any culture to survive for any length of time. And so Ma'at actually is a guardian of the quantum gate. She actually, it's like, if you can't, if you can't go through the process of passing the 70, or excuse me, the 42 negative confessions, which you do at the end of your life, then have your heart weighed by the feather of Ma'at, and if your heart is lighter than that, and that's where your soul resides, then it's saying your soul is lighter than the feather of Ma'at, the feather of truth, the feather of harmony, et cetera. Then you have the ability to pass through this gate and you get access to an afterlife life that's not typically described uh, today as, um, you know, we, we think of a lot of people think of, oh, as soon as you die, you know, you just go to your next spot, you just do your next thing. And you know, back in back in the ancient past, people didn't really think in such generalizations. They really had very specific ideas about how you were created, what your purpose was, and where you're going after you leave this earth. And that's something that's also been missing um, from the conversation when it comes down to the ultra ancient understanding of what they were trying to accomplish on the Giza Plateau, for example. It's a mathematical model that connects the idealized human being, which in this, in, in regards to Egypt is, is the king, but king is, king is everyone, everyone that actually steps into this higher um, ethics and morality based construct that allows us to move beyond our animal instincts into these higher realms, gives us an opportunity to go to higher spaces in our afterlife life. So the idea is they created a, a, a giant network that is completely connects the idealization of the human being with the earth and the heavens. And that's something you see in almost every culture in, uh, as far as uh, this description between us, the heavens, and the earth. And that there's an actual relationship and it's actually geometric um, in certain regards. And that, that means in certain regards, meaning that all, the, um, all of the monumental constructions are following these uh, harmonics to maintain our ability to stay connected with the earth and heavens. Something you're going to show us on your screen share? Yeah, I'll pull that up. Um, the first one is the one that uh, everyone has uh, seen this, and there's a lot of new conversations happening um, about um, what uh, Michelangelo painted uh, on the Sistine Chapel with God and Adam uh, touching fingers with each other. And uh, so what we're gonna look at here is, there we go, say no to that. So here we have, um, this is the image in the center and it shows Adam reaching out to God. And what you're seeing is um, in that particular, the center image, you're seeing a yellow um, outline and it's following the outline of the brain that's, a, that's in the image above. And then below in the magenta color uh, is, is outline of the heart. And all I've done is uh, I've just placed 
those two outlines in their proper proportion over this cloak that God and his angels are um, in front of. And what I'm trying to show is that while so many people believe it's just the brain, um, you can see just here with the yellow line, it doesn't connect to the whole backside of the cape or a drape that's behind God. And But when you look at the heart, it extends because you have these valves and uh, arteries and veins that connect off the heart. It creates this much broader and uh, kind of more detailed version of what God is sitting behind. And this becomes important um, from my point of view, because as I said, um, Egypt, um, when they did their mummification and they followed through their whole process of turning the king's his ka, which is his um, his vital body, his electromagnetic body, and his ba, his soul personality. Once he passes through all these gates, then there's a ceremony that puts them together to create the ak or the body of light, and that's what people use. That's what the kings and all beings that are in that same space um, travel with. So what what's being shown here is is that um, the brain is not the initiator. The brain's the translator. The heart is the initiator because, as I said, the brain gets thrown away. Um, it is the heart that is weighed, not the brain. Um, they found so from the Egyptian uh, story, they're the ones that um, put forward this idea. And it is them that use the feather of Ma'at, which comes from this character named Shu. Um, He's the second manifestation after Atum. Uh, anyways, uh, that this is part of Ma'at and part of what this idea of harmony and order and essentially this idea of allegiance and how these are actually acting as one. Um, so that's part of it. That's, that's where we're going to be hanging out when we actually start communicating. But this is going to be just something that um, kind of gives you a sense of what we're going to be looking at. So what you're seeing here, I'm going to blow it up. So this image I found um, quite some time ago, back in like 20, uh, 2014. And I was really attracted to it because I saw it doing uh, certain geometric things. Um, but I couldn't verify whether or not that, was, that image was drawn properly because it's just an image. So it, it was in a book. So it wasn't until November this last year that I actually got a pictures of it. And this is one of those pictures. Um, this is on the um, outer, pylon, outer pylon of the Temple of Khonshu, which is part of the Karnak Temple. And when I saw this, this became a really big component of my own uh, work. Uh, because, the, like I said, these three triangles actually interact with each other in a very specific way. And they're part of the model that creates the Giza Plateau pyramid complex. So I'm just showing you that this, interestingly enough, so what you're looking at right now is showing the kind of whole number um, resonant harmonics that this image generates. And this was done by the Egyptians. But when you go over to this image, this is at Edfu. This is an Edfu was built by the Greeks. And what you see is you see the same three characters. They're not in the same order. And they're not doing the same mathematical arrangement. In other words, there isn't a mathematical arrangement in how they were put together. And this was done by the Greeks, which just shows you the Greeks really didn't know everything about Egypt. Um, and that's something that's quite significant because so much has been pulled from Egypt and their understanding of what's happening in Egypt. And, and they really didn't know certain things. So therefore, they can't really be used as the uh, ultimate authority on what the Egyptians were doing. Um, the last thing I want to show here is just when I first started working with um, doing drawings to find what is the actual layout of the Giza Plateau, because I was absolutely sure. Nobody was talking about it back then. The only body, the only, when uh, the Flower of Life uh, teachings, they just talked about the Great Pyramid and that it was built in 10,500 BCE. There was no connection to the other two pyramids and there was no statement that these three pyramids created any kind of unity model. Um, well, I believe that it did. And so I ended up abandoning that whole idea. 
But what happened was I, when I first started drawing, I was using other people's drawings to draw off of. And this is an example. I'll just blow it up. So this drawing here, this is from JARS. Uh, they're a uh, nonprofit organization based out of Egypt uh, and I think in America as well. And they were doing all the verse surveys uh, and they were the ones that did the original Sphinx mapping project. And what you're looking at is this is just one of the drawings that they put out that was spoke that went to all the universities around the world. Well, if you were to try to use, so look, if I blow this up, if you can look here, that's the third pyramid. Well, the green is where the third pyramid is supposed to be. And the black charcoal color behind it and, and offset to the upper left, that's where they drew it. So if you tried to use that drawing to do any kind of a geometric exploration, well, you got the wrong answer. And this is the same. This is now in 2011. The other was 2001. This is AERA. AERA is um, American Egyptologist uh, Research and Associates. So those guys, that's Mark Leonard's group. They are running the Giza Plateau mapping project now. And Mark Leonard was part of the original Sphinx mapping project. So both of these uh, drawings forced me to use um, a survey, um, and I use Sir Flinders Petrie survey, um, in order to figure out what the actual geometrical arrangement was for the three pyramids. But what happened was each time I would use one of these other people's drawings, they would create a different geometric answer. And that's, that's impossible. So in order to discover what is actually happening on the Giza Plateau, I went to, um, like I said, I went to Sir Flanders Petrie. And once I did that, it was just a matter of about a couple of hours. And uh, the Great Pyramid and the Third Pyramid revealed exactly how they were laid out on the plateau in relation to this much larger field. And this larger field is this quantum gate. And it is massive. It is over five miles in diameter. And it, me it also measures the Earth, um, just like the Great Pyramid measures the Earth. Um, this much larger model also measures the Earth, but in a better way, in a way that's more functionally useful. I don't know anybody why anyone would need to know um, the radius of the Earth's polar, you know, it's, it's polar radius. I don't know why, how does that help anybody do anything? I mean, you can't use it to survey with, <laughs> you know, but if you actually have something that's measuring the circumference of the earth, that's a whole different equation. And that's something that's com completely useful because as you're traveling, you're using it, you're measuring with it and you're, you're refining your measuring system. So um, this is the key to what I'm going to be um, bringing forward and then showing throughout all of the rest of Egypt, which includes uh, 750 years at least prior to when Egyptians say um, the pyramids were built or Egyptologists say the, uh, the pyramids were built all the way through to uh, Dendara, which was built by the Ptolemies. So that's at the end of Egypt, pretty much within a few hundred years. Uh, and showing how that this precise same simple mathematical model that measures the earth connects Every, all humans to the earth and allowed the, the Giza Plateau pyramid complex to function as a uh, tool for human consciousness evolution um, and exploration. And for me, that's what its primary focus was. Um, I don't see it as a water pump. I don't see it as an electrical device. I see it as a subtle energy device um, and that they work in harmony and that the three pyramids are really acting and functioning as essentially mooring posts. Mooring post is something you would tie a, tie a boat to. So, and in this particular case, the boat is Ra's solar bark uh, that gets tied to these three and they hold the frequencies of what it is and what its size is. And they uh, give, the, they open up the gate to actually then traveling to uh, the higher realms. So for me, huge big deal and ultimately something that both Egyptologists and alternative theorists will be able to get behind. Uh, again, whether or not they see, whether or not certain people see that the same knowledge can be projected back um, you know, far in the distant past, that's absolutely true. That can happen, that could be the case. But I'm going with where there's actual evidence um, that you can demonstrate and repeat. I'm not trying to create a new, concept. I'm just trying to 
well, I'm not trying to, I am uh, bringing forward the original system um, of menstruation that the Egyptians used and how that allowed them to send, at first send their king, um, but ultimately for every person to be able to use the same technique and the same pathways to be able to travel as well. And when you say travel, you mean travel to the stars. I do mean travel to the stars. And did I hear you say menstruation? <laughs> well, that means a system of measurement. Okay. Yeah, so okay. not, no, yeah, as a system of measurement. Okay, and here's another question. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by quantum gate? So, well, quantum is considered a discrete packet of energy. And so a quantum gate would be a discrete packet of energy that would allow something either to pass through or stop it from passing through. Um, and in this particular case, what you're passing through is this life into another life dimension. So that's what I mean by quantum gate and why it's the quantum gate of Ma'at is because Ma'at holds the functional keys that allows you to walk through. Um, if you don't know, if you don't have, in other words, you don't get to just decide, hey, I'm gonna you know, take something and that's gonna put me in an altered state of consciousness and that's gonna somehow raise my vibration to a level that I can walk through this gate. Probably not because different kinds of, of um, enhancements, mental enhancements and stuff, those don't actually change your vibration. It just puts you in another mindset. And this is something that's really being missed, which means we still have to do the actual physical work if you want to actually go and do stuff. You can't just sit on your ass and watch something and then go, wow, I've got it. You know, I mean, you actually have to apply these, these ideas. And, um, and so that's what I mean by quantum gate. It's just a gate that allows um, the king in this particular case, and ultimately ourselves, to be able to pass through this dimension into higher dimensions. And uh, uh, before, I thought the title was, uh, at the end, Circling the Divine. Circling the Divine Sound. Didn't you say? Didn't no, no, you... there's no, there's no, I did not attach a sound to that. Oh, okay. It said circling the divine. Um, and because it's geometry. And so we're using the circle and the circle is actually circling the divine to create a way for us to connect with the divine. Most people think that the geometry is the big deal, but actually the geometry is just a way for uh, us to direct our attention. So that through directing our attention, it's the space around all the geometry that's the big deal. It's not really the geometry itself, but the geometry itself provides an access for the mind to actually comprehend, let go of, and move into these higher states where geometry doesn't even exist. Well, I know that uh, the Tibetans and many other cultures use geometry exercises as kind of a spiritual practice. Oh, yeah. And, and they they use sound as well because they chant. And the mm -hmm. thing is, is what chanting does, uh, uh, we did a, um, a particular practice once where we did chanting, where we saw we were only doing OM. We had, and it took the, the, the process took about three hours because there were several people laying on beds, or not on beds, but on massage tables. Each person that was laying down saw the three or four people around them as the Christ that was giving them energy and everybody around them, uh, the person laying on the table that was receiving the energy, they saw that person as the Christ. And so, and then you were oming. And so you're moving your hands you're, and you're doing all this. And what happens is after your throat gets sore and all that, you know, some people can't make it, they break and they start talking about other stuff um, or I mean, using other tones and et cetera. But if you make it through, your whole body becomes like a giant bell. In every place that you put your attention, it doesn't matter where in your body or where outside, you are feeling it just as though you are that sound. And I think that's what a lot of people, you know, they do it. I do like two ohms or three ohms and they think, oh, wow, you know, I did ohms. It's like, no, there's, if you do it as a practice like the monks do, you really do move into some other spaces. And that's another way to get through and, and, and connect with that gate.
Well, I've done a lot of uh, mosaic tile work and <clears throat> I didn't understand or know the sacred geometry, but I could still get the pattern down without knowing the math. So it kind of taken a shortcut. But when I was cutting the tile and putting them, putting them in certain patterns, after working with tile day in and day out, especially like when you're tying the whole swimming pool and you have all these lines, when I go home at the end of the day and close my eyes, whether they're in the shower or going to sleep, suddenly all these geometries would start flashing through my head. That's all awesome. Patterns. That is super awesome. Well, yeah. that's what it does. I mean, you know, yeah. like, like attracts like. So if you're involved with geometry, uh, that's what happens. Um, what, what I've got up right now, this is actually the, the drawing that makes um, the relationship between the Great Pyramid and the Second Pyramid. Um, it's a super simple pattern. Um, the the Vesca Pisces or Piscis, I guess everybody says Piscis, I that must be its proper, proper uh, saying, but the two red circles that make the Vesca Piscis and uh, cr which create the red square, that red square's base is the square root of three. And then by drawing, this yellow, this this yellow line that meets uh, the red circle, and then I go from the center of the Vesca Piscis, and then I draw this arc that goes across, and then I make these two circles where they cross each other. That makes the yellow circle, and that yellow circle is the size of the second pyramid, and their mathematical relationship is the square root of three, square root of three, to the golden mean proportion. Um, and to me, that is a massively huge, super easy thing because that takes about two minutes to draw. And so, you know, in my mind, that's not that's not high math. That's kind of the simplest level of doing mathematics with shapes. Um, and here I'm just showing it where if you take the uh, measure, the empirical measures based on Petri survey, 9,086.6 divided by 8474.9, that's the second pyramid, you get this number 1.0705. Then you go geometric square root of three, divided by pi, 1.0746. And you go 440 royal cubits divided by 411, and you get the same 1.0705. So this to me is something that makes the Giza and everything else so um, accessible to us is because it really is, it's this kind of simplicity that actually builds all of it. Um, where you find all the complicatedness is really in the surveying. And then of course, moving heavy stones. Um, and, then if, and then if you believe that carving granite is a high technology, then that would also be one. But surveying is the big deal because surveying, they were so amazing at it uh, or whoever surveyed where the three pyramids are located on the Giza Plateau. Um, they were incredibly amazing. And um, so for myself, when I discovered this, this particular model, um, that, and then I got uh, Sir Flander Petrie's measurements, it just led to this incredible journey that I've been on for the last many years. And in fact, at the beginning of this journey, you and I met in 2016. And that was um, at an event that was happening in, um, or it might have been 2017, beginning of, that was happening in Sedona. Uh, I met Dr. J.J. Hurtek at that time. He started looking at my work. Uh, I met um, several others, in, including yourself. And uh, But back then, I didn't know where the second pyramid was locating. And, and it wasn't until I put my attention on the Sphinx, which is ironic because everybody says the Sphinx is this super ultra ancient construction. And yet the geometry is completely aligned to the second pyramid, not the first pyramid or the third. It's aligned to the second pyramid um, in exactly precisely where it's sitting and its actual size. So for myself, this, this is going to be one of those scenarios where, uh, where we agree to get, disagree as to who knew what, when, and where, and how. Because you have to start including the entire Giza plateau um, if you're trying to project beyond the pyramid age of the Egyptians. And that's gonna make really all the alternative uh, history theorists, it's good, they're gonna have to adjust what they believe so that 
what I'm showing uh, actually um, supports their theory uh, because at, at this point the geometry is 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 completely conclusive. It's there's no there's no doubt, um, and that's why the Egyptologists were so excited about it, is they saw that oh no my God this is completely new and it makes their life a lot more fun too because now they can learn a whole bunch of other stuff, um, and ultimately. I see this as the beginning of a new curriculum um, that can teach kids about geometry by using ancient Egypt as a case study. Uh, because now that we have all of the tools, what the Egyptians used, we'll actually be able to create a, a much more fun way to learn about geometry. Uh, I, I hated it, just by the way. I, I loved math until I got to geometry. I'm very visual. I'm left-handed. Um, I don't. I don't like proofs and theorems. I was a visual geometrist, not an abstract uh, analytical geometrist. I don't care for uh, abstract analytical geometry much at all. Uh, but visual geometry, I've always excelled at um, and loved doing. I've been drawing for almost my whole life. Uh, and um, when I was really young, um, back in my early twenties. I worked for a marine architect and I was the, the youngest uh, technical illustrator there. Um, I ran um, a, a project for um, redoing all the, uh, the heavy duty uh, elevators for um, the largest uh, aircraft, non-nuclear aircraft carrier, which is the CBC-62, the USS Independence. And um, I had a, a, a team of uh, illustrators that I helped train and work with. And then we worked with, um, uh, technical writers, and basically we were rebuilding, we were building the first Haynes kind of automotive manual for uh, weapons elevators um, for the military, uh, because their, their manuals were just these 2D machine drawings, and kids can't, they look at it, they don't know what the hell they're looking at. So that was something I've, I've been involved with drawing um, for pretty much as long as I can remember, and Egypt's just been the really kind of my passion project. Uh, because I really feel like it's it's been misused and kind of abused in certain ways. Um, I, I believe in the netters as aspects of human consciousness. I don't look at them as gods and goddesses. Um, I know that a lot of people do. And that's fine. That's their thing. Um, but I, I don't see them that way. Um, I see them really as aspects of ourself. And it's just the easiest way to take a non-literate culture and to teach them about the higher reality of human behavior and consciousness. It's like, if you don't have vehicles that you can actually put information into, it's like, okay, they house this information. These guys are housing this information. And then you start studying, just like if you study um, physiology and anatomy, you know, you have, you don't, they don't just like go willy nilly, you know, and start cutting people open or whatever. Okay, well, oh, what is that? And start naming it. You know, we've already figured it all out. We break it into systems. And then we teach each system and people to become uh, proficient and then ultimately master these various ways of looking at stuff. And I believe that was the whole purpose uh, behind what you see going on in Egypt. The whole idea was perfection of the soul, perfection of the soul so that we can rise and have a life beyond our physical life. That was that was their intent. Um, that's what I see. And that's what I'll be teaching. Cool. Well, this isn't the first uh, Zoom we're going to have. We're going to have others, and uh, leading up to the event, we're going to invite some other people, the other people being the people who choose to attend uh, yeah. for the weekend or the live stream. Uh, so we're going to have a couple more Zooms before we get together in person in Sedona, which is an amazing time to be here in the Southwest, right, as the autumn is starting to come in uh we'll have some really cool experiences we'll have some catered food set up and um, we're going to have a great weekend for teaching so those people who are going to want to be here in person it's going to be a very limited intimate gathering of only 20 people so you're going to want to get your ticket as soon as possible for those who can't make it in person who still want to join us we will have a live stream so that you can tune in and be with us vicariously. So I, we thank you so much for uh, joining us today and giving us a brief overview. We're looking forward to really diving into this deeper because 
I know that the geometry, the math, the philosophies, uh, the designs, everything, the mythology is all intricately uh, put together for us, the people who come afterwards, to be able to redecipher. So I think it's important what you're doing, and uh, thank you for well, thank bringing you. that forward. Yeah, it's something that um, I mean. What, what the one thing that's really beautiful about this is though. There are people, yes, you know, there's a small group of people that have watched my work for years now develop. Um, but this is really, this is, this is the first, this is the big push out into the public domain. This is that, you know, there's not going to be a first again, you know, in revealing this because it does rewrite Egyptian history uh, to the extent that it rewrites ultra ancient history that will be seen as time goes on or whether or not people can take this information and push it backwards uh, in time. But certainly they'll be able to use it to move both horizontally. So look at other cultures at the same time period, see if they're using the same ideas, precisely the same ideas as what the Egyptians did. And that, that would give us a handle on to what extent this was a world understanding uh, and not just something that's happening in Egypt. And this is gonna be a course specifically for teachers who are teaching others. Yuko and I were teaching Drembelow's workshop in Japan for many years. We taught the hands-on and the ohm like you're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. We had that practice in there and yeah. um, sacred geometry or, you know, basic initial sacred geometry was all a part of that. But those, those different um, little overlapping uh, disciplines really help people and lit them up, got them all excited. And so I could see the same thing happening from this weekend that we're going to spend with you in Sedona. Well, it's definitely going to be an upgrade uh, at every level. Um, it's something that, like I said, I've, I've been excited. I was planning on putting this out in 2020. Um, I was, I just met with uh, Dr. JJ Hurtek and Got to spend about an hour and 45 minutes with him. I showed him um, in more detail my work. I mean, he he was blown away, which is which is saying something for Dr. JJ Hertek to be blown away. Um, but and that was going to come out in April of that year. And then the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, it shut everybody down. You have to have a small group of people that are receiving it. Uh, directly as part of that oral tradition and that oral transmission that is so pertinent to this kind of understanding. Because otherwise it just gets lost as just another set of patterns. And so I'm super excited about uh, presenting this to whoever it is that chooses that this is their moment to learn something that no one else knows about. Yeah, and I think it'll be valuable for uh, tour guides to Egypt or people who are regularly studying research in Egypt. Uh, People who are traveling to Egypt regularly, if you have this information, you're going to go on a tour there to Egypt, you're going to get so much more out of what you're looking at uh, oh, just from having this information that you're going to reveal over this weekend. Okay, well, uh, thank you again, Ty. Uh, we're looking thank forward you. to the other Zoom meetings. And again, if you're planning on attending either by the live stream or in person, you want to get your ticket as soon as possible so we can get you on the list for the Zoom as well. There you and, go. And uh, we'll be following up more uh, before then and uh, look forward to seeing you then, Ty. Right on. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to uh, being part of this uh, process and uh, dialing in with um, Earth Origins 5 as a continuation of that process. Um, this absolutely connects in with that in that we are talking about origins in relation to a geometric set. I can say that I can I can push not not the pattern that I'm showing for Egypt, but geometry itself. We can push back into go back to Tepe now. Um, there was someone who put out work a couple of years ago. Um, they had an idea. It was a good idea, but they missed the mark. But it led to something. And so we'll be revealing that as well. So Go Belkatepe is dialed in now as something that's got a geometric component to it. Uh, and that's a big deal as also, because that's showing a, a level of thinking that's much more rational. It's much more in tune with higher levels of consciousness. Awesome. All right, Ty. Well, thanks again. And we'll be talking to you soon. All right. Aloha, my man.
Talk Aloha. to you soon. Yeah. Okay, bye.